Chapters 17 through 20 of the Gospel according to Luke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more info, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Penfold. The Gospel according to Luke from the New Testament in Modern Speech. Translated by Richard Francis Weymouth. Chapters 17 through 20. Chapter 17 Jesus said to his disciples, It is inevitable that causes of stumbling should come, but alas for him through whom they come! It would be well for him if, with a millstone round his neck, he were lying at the bottom of the sea, rather than that he should cause even one of these little ones to fall. Be on your guard. If your brother acts wrongly, reprove him, and if he is sorry, forgive him. And if seven times in a day he acts wrongly towards you, and seven times turns again to you and says, I am sorry, you must forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, Give us faith. If your faith, replied the Lord, is like a mustard seed, you might command this black mulberry tree, Tear up your roots and plant yourself in the sea, and instantly it would obey you. But which of you who has a servant ploughing or tending sheep will say to him when he comes in from the farm, Come at once and take your place at table, and will not rather say to him, Get my dinner ready, make yourself tidy, and wait upon me till I have finished my dinner, and then you shall have yours? Does he thank the servant for obeying his orders? So you also, when you have obeyed all the orders given you, must say, There is no merit in our service. What we have done is only what we were in duty bound to do. As they pursued their journey to Jerusalem, he passed through Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, ten men met him who were lepers and stood at a distance. In loud voices they cried out, Jesus, Rabbi, take pity on us. Perceiving this, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And while on their way to do this, they were made clean. One of them, seeing that he was cured, came back, adoring and praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at the feet of Jesus, thanking him. He was a Samaritan. Were not all ten made clean? Jesus asked. But where are the nine? Have none been found to come back and give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has cured you. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered, The kingdom of God does not so come that you can stealthily watch for it, nor will they say, See here or see there, for the kingdom of God is within you. Then, turning to his disciples, he said, there will come a time when you will wish you could see a single one of the days of the Son of Man, but will not see one. And they will say to you, See there! See here! Do not start off and go in pursuit. For just as the lightning, when it flashes, shines from one part of the horizon to the opposite part, so will the Son of Man be on his day. But first he must endure much suffering, and be rejected by the present generation. And as it was in the time of Noah, so will it also be in the time of the Son of Man. Men were eating and drinking, taking wives and giving wives, up to the very day on which Noah entered the ark, and the deluge came and destroyed them all. The same was true in the time of Lot. They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, God rained fire and brimstone from the sky and destroyed them all. Exactly so will it be on the day that the veil is lifted from the Son of Man. On that day, if a man is on the roof and his property indoors, let him not go down to fetch it, and in the same way, he who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Any man who makes it his object to keep his own life safe will lose it, but whoever loses his life will preserve it. On that night, I tell you, there will be two men in one bed, one will be taken away, and the other left behind. There will be two women turning the mill together. One will be taken away, and the other left behind. 
Where, master? they inquired. Where the dead body is, he replied. There also will the vultures flock together. Chapter 18 He also taught them by a parable that they must always pray and never lose heart. In a certain town, he said, there was a judge who had no fear of God and no respect for man. And in the same town was a widow who repeatedly came and entreated him, saying, Give me justice, and stop my oppressor. For a time he would not, but afterwards he said to himself, Though I have neither reverence for God nor respect for man, yet because she annoys me, I will give her justice to prevent her from constantly coming to pester me. And the Lord said, Hear those words of the unjust judge. And will not God avenge the wrongs of his own people who cry aloud to him day and night, although he seems slow in taking action on their behalf? Yes, he will soon avenge their wrongs. Yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And to some who relied on themselves as being righteous men, and looked down upon all others, he addressed this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray he said, one being a Pharisee, and the other a tax-gatherer. The Pharisee, standing erect, prayed as follows by himself, O oh God, I thank thee that I am not like other people. I am not a thief, nor a cheat, nor an adulterer, nor do I even resemble this tax-gatherer. I fast twice a week, I pay the tithe on all my gains. But the tax-gatherer standing far back would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but kept beating his breast and saying, O oh God, be reconciled to me, sinner that I am. I tell you that this man went home more thoroughly absolved from guilt than the other, for every one who uplifts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be uplifted. On one occasion people also brought with them their infants for him to touch them. But the disciples, noticing this, proceeded to find fault with them. Jesus, however, called the infants to him. Let the little children come to me, he said. Do not hinder them, for it is to those who are childlike that the kingdom of God belongs. I tell you in solemn truth that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will certainly not enter it. The question was put to him by a ruler. Good rabbi, what shall I do to inherit the life of the ages? Why do you call me good? replied Jesus. There is no one good but one, namely God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not lie in giving evidence. Honor thy father and thy mother. All of those he replied, I have kept from my youth. On receiving this answer, Jesus said to him, There is still one thing wanting in you. Sell everything you possess, and give the money to the poor, and you shall have wealth in heaven. And then come, follow me. But on hearing these words he was deeply sorrowful, for he was exceedingly rich. Jesus saw his sorrow, and said, with how hard a struggle do the possessors of riches ever enter the kingdom of God! Why, it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Who then can be saved? exclaimed the hearers. Things impossible with man, he replied, are possible with God. Then Peter said, See, we have given up our homes and have followed you. I solemnly tell you, replied Jesus, that there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of God's kingdom, who shall not certainly receive many times as much in this life, and in the age that is coming, the life of the ages. Then he drew the twelve to him and said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything written in the prophets which refers to the Son of Man will be fulfilled for he will be given up to the Gentiles, and be mocked, outraged, and spit upon. They will scourge him and put him to death, and on the third day he will rise to life again. 
nothing of this did they understand. The words were a mystery to them, nor could they see what he meant. As Jesus came near to Jericho, there was a blind man sitting by the wayside, begging. He heard a crowd of people going past, and inquired what it all meant. "'Jesus the Nazarene is passing by,' they told him. Then at the top of his voice he cried out, "'Jesus, son of David, take pity on me!' Those in front reproved him and tried to silence him, but he continued shouting louder than ever, "'Son of David, take pity on me!' At length Jesus stopped and desired them to bring the man to him. And when he had come close to him, he asked him, "'What shall I do for you?' "'Sir,' he replied, "'let me recover my sight.' "'Recover your sight,' said Jesus. "'Your faith has cured you.' No sooner were the words spoken than the man regained his sight and followed Jesus, giving glory to God. And all the people, seeing it, gave praise to God. Chapter 19 So he entered Jericho and was passing through the town. There was a man there called Zacchaeus, who was the local surveyor of taxes, and was wealthy. He was anxious to see what sort of man Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran on in front and climbed up a mulberry tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. As soon as Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for I must stay at your house today. So he came down in haste and welcomed him joyfully. When they all saw this, they began to complain with indignation. He has gone in to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they said. Zacchaeus, however, stood up, and addressing the Lord, said, Here and now, Master, I give half my property to the poor, and if I have unjustly exacted money from any man, I pledge myself to repay to him four times the amount. Turning towards him, Jesus replied, Today salvation has come to this house, seeing that he too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. As they were listening to his words, he went on to teach them by a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said to them, A man of noble family traveled to a distant country to obtain the rank of king, and to return. And he called ten of his servants, and gave each of them a pound, instructing them to trade with the money during his absence. Now his countrymen hated him and sent a deputation after him to say, We are not willing that he should become our king. And upon his return, after he had obtained the sovereignty, he ordered those servants to whom he had given the money to be summoned before him, that he might learn their success in trading. So the first came and said, Sir, your pound has produced ten pounds more. Well done, good servant, he replied, because you have been faithful in a very small matter. Be in authority over ten towns. The second came and said, Your pound, sir, has produced five pounds. So he said to this one also, And you, be the governor of five towns. The next came, Sir, he said, here is your pound, which I have kept wrapped up in a cloth. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take up what you did not lay down, and you reap what you did not sow. By your own words, he replied, I will judge you, you bad servant. You knew me to be a severe man, taking up what I did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money into a bank, that when I came I might have received it back with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the pound from him, and give it to him who has the ten pounds. They said to him, Sir, he already has ten pounds. I tell you that to every one who has anything, more shall be given, and from him who has not anything, even what he has shall be taken away. But as for those enemies of mine who are unwilling that I should become their king, bring them here and cut them to pieces in my presence. After thus speaking, he journeyed onward, proceeding up to Jerusalem. 
And when he was come near Bethphage and Bethany in the mount called the Olive Yard, he sent two of the disciples on in front, saying to them, Go into the village facing you. On entering it you will find an ass's foal tied up which no one has ever yet ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying the colt? Simply say, The master needs it. So those who were sent went and found things as he had told them. And while they were untying the colt, the owners called out, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The master needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their outer garments on the colt, they placed Jesus on it. So he rode on while they carpeted the road with their garments. And when he was now getting near Jerusalem, and descending the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began in their joy to praise God in loud voices for all the mighty deeds they had witnessed. Blessed is the King, they cried, who comes in the name of the Lord, in heaven peace and glory in the highest realms. Thereupon some of the Pharisees in the crowd appealed to him, saying, Rabbi, reprove your disciples. I tell you, he replied, that if they became silent, the very stones would cry out. When he came into full view of the city, he wept aloud over it and exclaimed, Oh, that at this time thou hadst known, yes, even thou, what makes peace possible, but now it is hid from thine eyes, for the time is coming upon thee when thy foes will throw up around thee earthworks and a wall, investing thee and hemming thee in on every side and they will dash thee to the ground and thy children within thee, and will not leave one stone upon another within thee, because thou hast not recognized the time of thy visitation. Then Jesus entered the temple and proceeded to drive out the dealers. It is written, he said, and my house shall be the house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's cave. And day after day he taught in the temple, while the high priests and the scribes were devising some means of destroying him, as were also the leading men of the people. But they could not find any way of doing it, for the people all hung upon his lips. Chapter 20 On one of those days, while he was teaching the people in the temple and proclaiming the good news, the high priests came upon him, and the scribes, together with the elders, and they asked him, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? And who is it that gave you this authority? I also will put a question to you, he said. Was John's baptism of heavenly or of human origin? So they debated the matter with one another. If we say heavenly, they argued, he will say, Why did you not believe him? And if we say human, the people will all stone us for they are thoroughly convinced that John was a prophet. And they answered that they did not know the origin of it. Nor will I tell you, said Jesus, by what authority I do these things. Then he proceeded to speak a parable to the people. There was a man, he said, who planted a vineyard, let it out to vine dressers, and went abroad for a considerable time. At vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers for them to give him a share of the crop. But the vine dressers beat him cruelly and sent him away empty handed. Then he sent a second servant, and him too they beat and ill treated and sent away empty handed. Then again he sent a third, and this one also they wounded and drove away. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What am I to do? I will send my son, my dearly loved son. They will probably respect him. But when the vine dresser saw him, they discussed the matter with one another and said, This is the heir, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they turned him out of the vineyard and murdered him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and put these vine dressers to death and give the vineyard to others. God forbid! exclaimed the hearers. He looked at them and said, What then does that mean which is written? The stone which the builders rejected has been made the cornerstone. Every one who falls on that stone will be severely hurt, but on whomsoever it falls, he will be utterly crushed. At this the scribes and the high priests wanted to lay hands on him, then and there. Only they were afraid of the people, for they saw that in this parable he had referred to them. 
So after impatiently watching their opportunity, they sent spies who were to act the part of good and honest men, that they might fasten on some expression of his, so as to hand him over to the ruling power and the governor's authority. So they put a question to him. Rabbi, they said, we know that you say and teach what is right, and that you make no distinctions between one man and another, but teach God's way truly. Is it allowable to pay a tax to Caesar or not? But he saw through their knavery, and replied, Show me a shilling. Whose likeness and inscription does it bear? Caesar's, they said. Pay, therefore, he replied, what is Caesar's to Caesar, and what is God's to God. There was nothing here that they could lay hold of before the people, and marveling at his answer, they said no more. Next some of the Sadducees came forward, who deny that there is a resurrection, and they asked him, Rabbi, Moses made it a law for us that if a man's brother should die, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up a family for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first of them took a wife and died childless. The second and the third also took her, and all seven, having done the same, left no children when they died. Finally, the woman also died. The woman then, at the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? For they all seven married her. The men of this age, replied Jesus, marry, and the women are given in marriage. But as for those who shall have been deemed worthy to find a place in that other age, and in the resurrection from among the dead, the men do not marry, and the women are not given in marriage. For indeed, they cannot die again. They are like angels, and are sons of God through being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead rise to life even Moses clearly implies in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not a God of dead, but of living men, for to him are all living. Then some of the scribes replied, Rabbi, you have spoken well. From that time, however, no one ventured to challenge him with a single question. Uh, but he asked them, How is it they say that the Christ is a son of David? Why, David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I have made thy foes a footstool under thy feet. David himself therefore calls him Lord, and how can he be his son? Then, in the hearing of all the people, he said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes, who like to walk about in long robes, and love to be bowed to in places of public resort, and to occupy the best seats in the synagogues, or at a dinner party who swallow up the property of widows and mask their wickedness by making long prayers, they will be punished far more severely than others. The end of chapters 17 through 20 of the Gospel according to Luke from the New Testament in Modern Speech Translated by Richard Francis Weymouth Recording by Mark Penfold